Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, today we're having Joe, who's going to talk to us a little about um, problems regarding wild cats and domestic cats. Um, Joe is working on Scottish cats, but she's not Scottish actually. She's English. Um, she's based at the university in Bristol. And she's been here at the EBD for one month. I don't know if you've seen her around. I haven't. But she's leaving tomorrow. Tomorrow's her last day here. So if you want to talk to her, do that quickly. Today or tomorrow. <laughs> um, okay, I'll let her talk. She'll have about 40 minutes. But just before she starts, uh, I wanted to thank Ivan, who's not here. But I don't know if you realize, we have a new screen here today. That screen was there and that wall until last week. <laughs> and because we have it here, we will never again have to move all the chairs in that direction or this direction. So yeah, thanks, Ivan, who allowed that. <laughs> okay, I give you the word now, Joe. Thank okay. you for being here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Jo. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of Bristol. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of my PhD work uh, using genomic tools to uh, support the conservation of the critically endangered Scottish wildcat population. Uh, so just briefly before I talk about Scottish wildcats, just to say that, um, well, thank you very much for having me at the EBD. I've been here for a month um, and I've been hosted by Jose Godoy's group uh, working on Iberian lynx genetics. Um, as part of a, a G-Bike initiative. Uh, so G-Bike is a, a network of researchers and conservation practitioners across Europe who are working uh, to assess uh, the genetic resilience of wild and captive populations. Um, and I've been working on testing effective population size as a genetic an indicator for genetic diversity using the Iberian lynx as a case study kind of population. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about that work, you can grab me afterwards as well. Um, but I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, Scottish wildcats. So um, <coughs> sorry if you already know a bit about cat biology, but just to put Scottish wildcats in the, a broader context, because there are uh, lots of populations that are commonly referred to as wildcats, uh, with wide distributions across Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, and these populations historically have a kind of continuous range, <coughs> and there is. Um, where they meet, they can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So debate is still raging about whether these cats, uh, cat populations constitute separate species or subspecies. Um, for now, I'm going to use the kind of currently accepted taxonomy, which is that we have uh, a, oh, there we go, uh, the European wildcat, Felis sylvestris, in Europe, and then three uh, subspecies of Felis libica, the African wildcat, the South African wildcat, and uh, the Asiatic wildcat and then Felis bieti, the Chinese mountain cat. So Scottish wildcats are a subpopulation of the European species, Felis sylvestris, um, native to Britain. Um, and that's gonna be the focal species for my talk today. Um, it's worth emphasizing at this point in the talk that none of these wildcat species are domestic cats. Domestic cats are their own separate species again, Felis catus. Um, they were originally domesticated here in the, the Near East in an area referred to as the Fertile Crescent from the local wildcat species, which would have been the North African wildcat. Uh, so they were first domesticated 9,000 years ago alongside the invention of crop farming. Um, so for this reason, unlike a lot of other uh, domesticated livestock species or dogs, they have this kind of uniquely commensal relationship with humans. So as we kind of built grain stores, these attracted rats and mice, which attracted local wildcat species, so we benefit from pest control and they benefit from this kind of ready supply of, of prey. Um, so they have had uh, been through this kind of strong selection process, mostly on their behaviour, so um, this most obviously their tolerance of humans, their tameness, um, but there's only been weak selection on their morphology. So this is why kind of domestic cats still look quite similar to, to wildcat species. Um, it's worth noting, um, oh well, I'll say that next, but yeah. Um, so since they've been domesticated, um, they obviously have spread worldwide. There's hundreds of millions of domestic cats all over the world. Um, from a conservation point of view, we mostly have kind of are concerned about cats as a, domestic cats as an invasive species. It's kind of very well documented impact on small uh, sp uh, small mammal and bird uh, populations. Um, but they also are ubiquitous across the range of all of these wildcat populations and are capable of. Uh, interbreeding to produce fertile offspring. Um, 
Uh, but where this is reported, it's usually at a very low level. So across uh, the rest of the range of Felis sylvestris, there's very low rate of hybridization. Um, unfortunately, this is not true in Scotland, uh, where the Scottish wildcat is now uh, considered a critically endangered species or a critically endangered population. And this is a direct result uh, of the hybridization with domestic cats. So uh, some brief background on Scottish wildcats. As I said, they're a subpopulation of the European wildcat, Felis sylvestris. They've been present in Britain since the end of the last ice age, nearly 10,000 years ago. Um, in Britain, as across the rest of Europe, there have been massive declines in wildcat populations uh, due to habitat loss, specifically forest habitat, um, and also heavy persecution as a kind of a small carnivore. They've been considered a pest species historically. Um, so in Britain, this means that um, there were local extinctions in England and Wales, and uh, wildcats were only present in the very north of the country, in the Scottish Highlands, from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so today, they have a very fragmented distribution across the Scottish Highlands. Uh, this is the Cairngorms National Park uh, in the north of Scotland, which is one of the kind of last strongholds of the wildcat in the UK. Um, in Scotland, they're a very well-loved species. Um, they've kind of mostly been forgotten about in England and Wales, but they um, have some significance in Highland culture. This is the, the symbol and the motto of the Macpherson clan, um, which is basically don't touch the cat without a glove on. Um, and they are, uh, well, well, despite this, they are still threatened uh, by heavy persecution, especially on shooting estates, by habitat loss or limited availability of good quality habitat. Prey species decline, most recently rabbits, um, but most importantly, this hybridization with domestic cats. Um, so here are some kind of recent-ish headlines following uh, the release of a, a review into the status of all the mammal species in Britain, um, of which wildcat comes out pretty near the top of the list of the most endangered mammal species in the UK. Um, there's estimated to be between only 30 and 430 individuals left in the wild. Uh, but this number is a bit controversial for reasons we'll, we'll come back to. Um, and this is uh, as a direct result of the, the hybridization. So in the wild in Scotland, there are now, well, virtually uh, all of the individuals have some domestic cat ancestry. Um, and this is uh, what we refer to as a hybrid swarm. So we don't just have first generation hybrids, but we have back crosses where hybrids back cross with the parent groups. And then we have matings between hybrids that makes this kind of really uh, continuum of genetic ancestries in the wild in Scotland. Um, and this is a result of what we call genetic swamping, where the native species kind of becomes overwhelmed by the frequency of the interbreeding with the introduced species. Um, and what we'll see without conservation intervention is a kind of complete replacement of wild cats in the wild in Scotland by hybrids or maybe even inevitably feral domestic cats. Um, so the wildcat has been quite intensively managed in Scotland over the last few decades, um, but hybridisation itself poses a, a kind of uh, challenge for conservation. Uh, so this is a kind of cartoon of a Scottish wildcat on the right-hand side and a, a mackerel tabby domestic cat on the left. Um, so there are some quite kind of uh, strong distinguishing features. Um, most obviously, wildcats have this kind of thick, uh, blunt-ended, ringed tail, whereas domestic cats have a more uh, a thinner more tapered tail with a dorsal stripe that goes all the way down to the end. But I'm sure you can appreciate that if you're trying to tell the difference between a wildcat and a hybrid, which will have a mix of features, especially in the field or from a camera trap image, it can be quite, quite challenging to distinguish between the two. And if you can't identify what you're trying to conserve, this slows down conservation management. Um, <coughs> excuse me, it stops us getting any uh, accurate population size estimates, and it makes the legal protection for wildcats in the UK um, basically ineffectual. So wildcats are a protected species, but feral domestic cats and hybrids can legally be controlled. Um, but if you can't tell the difference, then this protection doesn't really mean anything. Um, so another big challenge for the conservation program is that we don't really know how long hybridization has been happening in the UK. Um, we know um, that Domestic cats probably became widespread in Europe um, when they were introduced by the Romans. So the Roman occupation of Britain started nearly 2,000 years ago. So wild cats and domestic cats have been living in the Simpat tree for 2,000 years, potentially hybridizing for 2,000 years. Um, so that was kind of the introduction of domestic cats. Um, what we do know is by the time the Scottish Wild Cat Conservation Action Plan was released in 2013, so it's the first kind of coordinated national effort to con conserve the wild cat in the UK, 
Um, we knew then that hybridization was kind of a really big problem, but we don't know at what point between these two dates this started. Um, and this could be a problem for conservation if we kind of still having to have these debates about what it is that we're trying to conserve, what's left in Scotland. Um, and if we don't understand fully the history of hybridization, we can't pin down what's driving the hybridization. And that's going to be key to kind of preventing it into the future. Um, and if we don't understand kind of what went wrong in Scotland, um, then it can be quite difficult to prevent this happening in other wildcat populations across the species range. Um, there are some other key dates on, on this timeline. So I already mentioned the extinction, kind of local extinction of wildcats in England and Wales. Uh, this is 1880 was the last sighting of, a, of an English wildcat. Um, and this decline continued into the 20th century. So by 1918, this is when the Scottish wildcat population was thought to be at its lowest, just limited to a really small area in the northwest of the country. Um, but following the kind of conscription of a lot of gamekeepers into the army during the First World War, there was this kind of uh, reduced pressure from persecution. And at this uh, time, the Forestry Commission was also established in the UK, which worked to replant a lot of forest um, in Scotland. So there has been some limited recovery from this point forward. So this is kind of the hypothesised start date for the hy hybridisation in Scotland. So <coughs> the kind of working hypothesis is that as the wildcat population started to recover, it expanded, as, as it expanded, it kind of came into contact with domestic cat populations. Um, another key date is the founding of the captive wildcat population in 1960. So this was founded by wild individuals from Scotland. Um, there are now over 100 individuals in captivity in the UK, and these are managed as a, a conservation breeding programme by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Um, and then the last key date is kind of pretty late on um, legal protection for wildcats. So persecution was allowed legally up until this point and has kind of continued accidentally or illegally afterwards. Um, so working on this timeline was kind of the main aim of my PhD, which I finished last year at the University of Bristol. That's Bristol on a, on a dry day, so probably once, maybe five years ago. Um, so yeah, this was the key question from my, my PhD work, which is, can we use genetic tools to give a, a detailed understanding of the history and dynamics of hybridisation between wildcats and domestic cats in Scotland? Um, and we had this kind of two-pronged attack. So the first step was to develop an uh, approximate Bayesian computational model of wildcat demography in Scotland. Um, I'm not going to be talking about that today, but if anyone wants to chat about ABC stuff, more than happy to afterwards. Um, and the second kind of prong was de uh, generating a whole genome sequencing data set where we could, uh, which we could use to apply haplotype-based methods for accurate dating of admixture. And that's going to be the focus of, of the rest of this talk. Um, so this map just summarizes the whole genome sequencing data set that we generated for wildcats. Um, so we had this kind of global distribution of domestic cat reference samples. And then we sampled some putative sort of wildcat populations from Germany and Portugal. And in Scotland, we kind of called the captive population putatively wildcats. So these are thought to be kind of the least hybridized uh, uh, individuals left in the UK. And then 30 individuals from the wild in Scotland that were hybridized to varying extents. Um, so this principal component analysis summarizes quite nicely the genetic clustering between the samples in this data set. Um, so you can see PC1 explains a very large proportion of the genetic variation and it separates out the two parental groups. So domestic cats on one far end of the, the first principal component from modern populations of continental wildcats, the German and Portuguese wildcats, um, down the other end of PC1. And in between the two groups you have the, the hybrid swarm in Scotland. So you can see this continuum of genetic ancestries from very hybridized to least hybridized between the two parent groups. What's slightly difficult to make out are these green stars. Those are the captive individuals. Um, so they're kind of at the wildcatty end of this spectrum, but they, they are not in the, the nice wildcat group here. Um, what's interesting for this analysis, we also had access to some low coverage whole genome sequence data from historic samples. So four museum skins sampled uh, in Scotland in the early 1900s, and also um, data from some archeological material. So a medieval uh, British wildcat from the 16th century and a Mesolithic wildcat, uh, which is, was 6,000 years old, so predating the Roman introduction of domestic cats. And these are these gray and black ones here. So they cluster really nicely with modern populations of wildcats from Portugal and Germany. 
So this is kind of supporting this as a, as a pure wildcat pop, uh, cluster. Um, it also suggests that this hybrid swarm uh, postdates these early 20th century uh, museum samples, and this is kind of a recent phenomenon in Scotland. Um, so the next step was this haplotype-based analysis. Um, so when I'm talking about a, a haplotype, I mean a kind of a length of DNA uh, on a single copy of a chromosome that's usually inherited together. So cats, uh, like humans, are diploid. They have two copies of each chromosome, one uh, maternal, one paternal. <coughs> so in the, the first generation, after a hybridization event, a first generation hybrid will have one intact wildcat haplotype and one intact domestic cat haplotype. And then what happens in every single generation after this one is you have homologous recombination between chromosomes that uh, break down these uh, lengths into smaller and smaller chunks. Um, so this is really useful because then this chunk length gives information about the number of generations since the admixture event. So if you have nice long chunks, you're looking at quite a recent hybridization, and if you have lots of short chunks, you're looking at a much older hybridization event. So this is what we did for the Scottish wildcats using a program called Mosaic, which assigns what's called local ancestry uh, along the chromosome. So this is one Scottish wildcat individual's genome, or a hybrid, sorry, a Scottish wildcat hybrid's genome. So cats have 19 chromosomes, and so each row here represents a single chromosome um, with the two copies stacked on top of each other. And they're coloured here by the, the local ancestry, so blue for wildcat and uh, orange for domestic cat. So you can see this individual had one kind of quite wild catty parent and then one parent that was much more domestic cat. Um, but as I said, what we're interested in is the, the chunk length information. Um, so that helps us construct what's called a co-ancestry curve. So this kind of charts the, the decay of chunk length. Um, so you can plot this per individual, which are these faint grey lines, and then you can use that to get an overall estimate of the population mean, which are the, is these black and grey lines. And the, the rate parameter of this exponential decay curve is equivalent to the number of generations since the admixture event. Um, so for our sample of Scottish hybrids, we get a population mean of 8.6 generations. And if we look at the individual co-ancestry curves and we assume a generation time of three years for wildcats, um, this gives us a distribution of times starting in the late 1950s until 2000 and peaking <coughs> in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and this kind of fits with these, these points, estimates are just hybrid in indices of various samples collected over the, the last 120 years. You can see kind of historic samples have a much uh, smaller proportion of domestic ancestry vers versus these modern samples. Um, so this puts the date for the onset of hybridisation in Scotland much later than we thought. So it seems that this population expansion probably didn't fully explain the hybridisation in Scotland. Um, and it also highlights how quickly this hybrid swarm has formed. So we've gone from a population here where, where hybridization events are probably very rare, and then within 10 generations we have a population on the verge of extinction as a result of hybridization. Um, so a kind of working hypothesis at the moment is that this population expansion of wildcats as a result of these longer term threats, so poor quality habitat, heavy persecution, meant that uh, the kind of re-establishment of the wildcat range in Scotland would still remain very fragmented, uh, still with a low density of wildcats, and this made the population uh, incredibly vulnerable to hybridisation. Um, the good news is that um, it seems like the, uh, the captive population was probably founded at almost exactly the right time to kind of uh, preserve as much of the remaining wildcat diversity as possible, uh, despite the fact that kind of genetic tests for hybrids didn't exist at this point. Um, and the captive population will be a really important resource for the conservation programme moving forwards. Um, so now that we have these local ancestry estimates, there are lots of other really cool things that we can do with them. Um, the first thing we can do is kind of pull out the, the separate the wildcat ancestry from the domestic cat ancestry. Um, we could kind of, if we wanted to, reconstruct a kind of artificial intact Scottish wildcat genome, which we kind of haven't been able to find yet in the wild. Um, and we can also analyse these two bits separately to get some kind of ancestry-specific uh, summaries or ancestry-specific population genetic measures that we previously couldn't do because they're not designed to work on hybrid populations. Uh, so a good example of this is effective population size. Um, effective population size is a measure of census size that takes genetic diversity into account. 
Um, so it kind of corresponds with census size, but it's not equivalent to census size. Um, so to estimate uh, effective population size, <coughs> we used a software called GON, which exploits linkage dis disequilibrium measures. Um, so you can see this first plot, this is using the hybrid data, so all, all the genetic data. And we get this really sharp drop uh, around 10 generations before present. And this is the kind of artifact um, from what's called mixture LD, which is where you use hybrid uh, kind of, or you have ancestry from two distinct populations within the same, within the same sample. Um, so this isn't very useful to tell us anything about effective population size. Um, we do use this to kind of support this recent onset of admixture, this drop at 10 generations kind of is, is within the confidence est uh, intervals of our mosaic analyses. Um, so what we can do is, as I said, analyse the domestic ancestry versus the wildcat ancestry separately, which is this second plot. Um, and this tracks much better with the historical kind of records of population census size for wildcats and domestic cats. You can see this kind of decline, population minimum and, and limited recovery over the 20th century uh, against this backdrop of steadily increasing domestic cat ownership in the UK. Um, again, we get this kind of artifactual steep drop here in domestic cats which is a similar as a result of a similar kind of uh, bias as this because of the, the sample of domestic cats we have it generates something similar to mixture LD. Um, but yeah. uh, another cool thing we can do is that we can look across the population um, to see if there's any regions of the genome that have excess domestic cat or wild cat ancestry uh, relative what we would expect if these chunks were just being broken down at random. Um, because these are candidate regions for areas that are under selection in the hybrid uh, population. Uh, so this top plot is across the sample of hybrid individuals, uh, the mean proportion of uh, domestic cat ancestry across the genome. So you can see this is the overall mean is at close to 50%, but there's significant uh, variation across different regions. Um, including several high peaks of excess domestic ancestry and this one position on chromosome 9 that's reached fixation. So 100% of the hybrid individuals have domestic cat ancestry at this location. Um, and then what we can do is, if we have a look at the second plot, we can test if any of these peaks are in significant, what we can consider significant excess for domestic ancestry. So this dashed line here is our threshold for what we consider to be significant. And uh, these, there are several peaks across the genome that pass this threshold. Uh, so these contain genes that are uh, potentially under selection in hybrids. And what's interesting is if you do the reverse, uh, there are no points in the genome that have excess wildcat ancestry. So there don't seem to be any wildcat genes that are under strong selection in the, the hybrid population. Um, so with this set of, we had 273 genes, uh, domestic cat genes, uh, putatively under selection. Um, including uh, part of the MHC locus on chromosome 5, um, but we can then test for any functional enrich enrichment across this gene set. So any of these genes linked to performing similar functions. Um, and we get a kind of overwhelming signal of genes uh, relating to, the Im to immune response or disease and pathogen resistance. Um, so our kind of hypothesis for this is that uh, domestic cats are a known reservoir of feline diseases, such as cat flu, feline leukemia virus, coronavirus, that have been documented to be passed to hybrids and domestic cats. Um, so this, these kind of results show that maybe the hybridization is also conferring, uh, along with the diseases, the genes that will help resist these diseases, and these are being selected for in the hybrid population. Um, so a concern is this kind of strong positive selection, short term is going to accelerate the genetic swamping of Scottish wildcats. Uh, so yeah, so those are kind of the headline results from some of my PhD work, that there's this really recent onset of hybridisation in Scotland, um, the hybrid swarm formed really rapidly, and this is a kind of important cautionary tale for other uh, scenarios that involve human-mediated hybridisation. Um, on the positive side, the captive population uh, we can show is, is less integrated than what's left in the wild, and will be a really important reservoir of wildcat genetic diversity. Um, and as I said, this concern that the short-term genetic swamping is going to be accelerated by this positive selection for genes uh, from domestic cats that are linked to immune function and pathogen resistance. Uh, so yeah, so that's um, everything. I'm happy to take some, some questions. Thank you very much, Joe. That was very, very interesting. Uh, okay, so we have time for questions, if you want to be the first one. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Very interesting. And so, if I understood you correctly, it seemed like you were suggesting that hybridization was favoured at the time of the bottleneck when the numbers were the lowest. Um, that reminds me of the case of the ruddy duck. I don't know if you know the ruddy duck story. The ruddy, what, ruddy duck oh, hybridization yeah, yeah, yeah. with the white headed duck mm -hmm. here, which I've been involved with. And people would, used to say, some people would argue, don't worry about the ruddy duck hybridization, it's just there's not enough ruddy ducks to mate together, let them all come, and then when there's enough of them, they will not hybridize anymore, which uh, I don't find very convincing. So I'm just wondering what really is the evidence that, that is the case in the case of the wildcat that, uh, you know, hybridization was really a product of there being so few at that time compared with maybe the Portugal and Germany situation? Yeah, so this is something that I think is going to need more follow-up work. So kind of this work is just to kind of date, date the, the admixture and hopefully that will put that in, we can start putting that in context then of what was happening in the wild cat population, the domestic cat population at the time. So there isn't any uh, kind of like, um, I think there needs to be more work to say this is the hard evidence that these are these are the specific drivers of hybridization. Um, but as I said, I kind of the hypothesis is that it's kind of there are lots of factors involved, and the kind of for me the bottom line seems to be that this hybridization is just a, a product of the long-term threats. So if you maintain the population at very low levels because of persecution, you have a fragmented distribution. So there's lots of kind of edges, if you like, to the, the population where they could be in contact with domestic cats. Um, and you maintain that over several hundred years, as is the case in the UK, then that's inevitably going to make the, the population vulnerable to hybridization. And then I guess if it, it will eventually reach a, a tipping point. So if you have two species with what we can assume are fairly strong isolating mechanisms if they've been living in sympatry for 2,000 years without hybridization. But and once you kind of open up and make the, the population vulnerable, you have hybrids which now can be a bridge between the two species and it's only just going to kind of snowball once you, once you have reached a certain threshold of, of hybrids in the population. So that's potentially what's happened is gotten as you've reached this tipping point where you can't, you can't go back because there's too many hybrids that are bridging the gap between the two species. I don't know if that answers your question. In terms of the specific drivers, I think we need to do more work to pin down how we got to that, that point. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very good. It's on? Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, do you see that, that these hybrids have more, are so more susceptible to different diseases like cats can have? So this is an area that I think would be really interesting to follow up. I think certainly in the UK, it seems to be more of a kind of species-led conservation. So the kind of immediate effort has been to kind of survey and preserve the, the wild cats that are left. And there hasn't been that much research done on the hybrid population. Um, so we don't really know the, the fitness of the hybrids, whether they're fitter in, in the current kind of habitats that are available in Scotland than their parents or less fit. Um, and that includes the kind of disease prevalence. So there have been some preliminary studies um, looking at disease prevalence in hybrids, and it seems to be kind of equivalent to, to feral domestic cats. Um, but yeah. And, and do you see any differences in behavior between this and what? Yeah, so there have been studies looking at um, their localization. So one of the kind of proposed isolating mechanisms between domestic cats and wild cats is they occupy very different habitats. So wild cats will avoid human settlements. Obviously, domestic cats will be around human settlements. And then it seems like the hybrids, not only are they kind of a bridge in terms of, of mating opportunities, but they're like a physical bridge that occupy both of these habitats. Um, so that's kind of from the wildcat point of view. From a habitat point of view, also you have um, smaller and smaller patches of kind of good wildcat habitat. You have more human dom dominated landscape that's going to be more uh, potentially, I mean, it'd be nice to study whether this is true, but potentially will favor kind of the hybrid and domestic cats more than the wildcats. Hi, thank you so much. It was a lovely talk. Um, I was curious to know whether some of those 
MHC genes, well, uh, alleles or genes that you found that were uh, selected for, uh, have been linked in some other feline species to disease resistance specifically? Yeah, so this is actually a really common phenomenon in, in hybrid uh, systems, is that you do see um, kind of any MHC diversity is usually beneficial for a population. So it's kind of one of the first things to pop out in, in hybrids where you have these massive changes in genetic diversity within the, the genome and they get kind of retained. So yeah, this is quite a common phenomenon in, in hybrid systems. A good example is the, the alpine ibex. They, it's the same, they, they uh, interbreed with domestic goats and you see the same there, yeah. Hey yo, thanks for the talk. Um, very interesting. So, so I have a couple of questions. One uh, refers to the captive population. So you mentioned it's somehow it avoided the integration problem, but still in the PCA there were some level of integration. Mm. So, so and my second question is uh, regarding that: is uh, is there any plans to try to breed out domestic ancestry in the captive population? <coughs> Yeah, so as you said, they have avoided the extent of hybridization that's in the wild, but they've not avoided it completely. Uh, on average, the captive population is, I think we estimate from our sample, around 15% have 15% domestic cat ancestry. Um, so it is possible you could selectively breed the population and get some summaries of kind of ancestry proportion and then just breed the individuals until you eventually try and breed out as much of the domestic cat variation as possible. Um, but the focus at the moment is to just to preserve uh, genetic diversity generally, just because the, the founding population was quite small. Um, so it's the, the main aim is just to maintain the available genetic diversity if that happens to include a bit of domestic cat at the moment. That's kind of, we're tolerating that at the moment, but yeah. And are there plans to reintroduce captive bred animals? To the wild. Yeah, so this is kind of ongoing. They just, uh, the Saving Wildcats project started a few years ago um, and they are breeding some of the captive animals uh, with the plan to kind of release them um, soon ish, maybe next year or the year after, um, but with kind of quite intensively managed, I think, to kind of hopefully limit the hybridization. And one last more technical question mm -hmm. uh, regarding the selection of introverts haplotypes and so, so what you, your signature for that, or the proof for that is just the, the, uh, the extent of, of the representation of haplotypes in the, in the wildcat, right? But is, so, so you are just selecting extreme values of the distribution, or, or you have a null model where those... Yeah, so we kind of fit a model that takes into account um, the individual's hybrid index and then so given the the indices of all the hybrids um, then if would you expect that region to have you know x amount of, of uh, in the genome can kind of fit this kind of sigmoid kind of curve and then um, that's so it takes into account the amount of domestic ancestry in the, in the individual so it's not just like the sum amount across the population it takes into account the spread of uh, the hybrid indices okay thank you So I'm just wondering, um, when you've got a hybrid swarm, do you think it's possible to come up with criteria for when you kind of give up uh, from a conservation <laughs> point of view? I uh, mean, for example, yeah. I don't know if you know the case of the New Zealand grey duck, which mm. is massively hybridised with mallards. seems like everybody's given up on mm. that case and nobody's making any serious suggestions to do anything about it. I wonder if also it's connected with, you know, our emotional reactions with different organisms like cats are very popular and if it was a m mouse would we care yeah. I don't know what do you think um well this is I kind of I spend a lot of time with people there seems to be two kind of camps in terms of conservation of hybrid systems because um, you kind of have the argument that it's good to try and maintain biodiversity often a hybrid swarm is kind of 
a temporary state, a sort of snapshot of a species that's on its way to this genetic swamping where you're going to have complete replacement. And in that case, that's a loss of biodiversity. It's usually a loss of native species genetic diversity. Um, and so kind of that's where I, I stand on that in terms of um, trying to, to, to stop complete genetic swamping. How you do that is quite difficult. But then there are other camps that kind of say, well, in t maybe it's better to consider um, uh, ecosystem services, the function that the organism provides in the, in the environment. Is it just going to be the same? Does it matter if we're losing the diversity? Um, so I think it kind of depends case by case on the system and the, the people that are involved. Um, but yeah, I think I think quite often it's maybe better to have a more a bottom-up approach because if you think in the ter in the case of the wildcat, those wildcats have been in Britain for ten thousand years. Natural selection has acted to make sure they're kind of as fit, you know, they're hope presumably more fit to live in Scottish wildcat habitat than domestic cats. Um, so maybe it, we need a kind of a more bottom-up approach where you you make you restore habitats and then hopefully the habitat will select the genes that are best suited for that, which logically should be kind of the native species genes but whether you can do that on a time scale that would stop a hybrid swarm from kind of taking out a species it's yeah it's difficult usually yeah it's quite hard to reverse a hybrid swarm without um, bringing in extra and you know uh, uh, translocating individuals or physically separating out kind of your best your best individuals yeah Anyone else? Let's just check if there is anything. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, then. Thank you very much. No. Okay. Thank you very much, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>